Digital Pilipinas is the largest private sector-led movement to build an ecosystem for innovation and technology for the country. And our hope is to not just take on some of the largest problems of the Philippines that are addressable with technology, but collectively to raise our innovation quotient as a country. We are experiencing a technology renaissance here in the Philippines, where the best and brightest from all over the world are actually choosing to domicile themselves here in the Philippines. Now what we're seeing is an influx of global technology talents choosing to headquarter themselves here in the Philippines because we have the greatest talent for it. We have a killer ecosystem, the most enabling regulators. So the formula for success to build a great technology business is here in the Philippines. Digital Filipinas as a movement represents the most expansive industry-driven effort to bring together the champions of emerging technologies with the business leaders who are committed to transforming the landscape. It is our honor and privilege to once again co-convene Digital Filipinas. Let the world feel the excitement as our nation becomes a center for innovation. This year, we have four priority areas. Number one is MSME digitalization and e-commerce. The ultimate objective is to be able to trade in trust and in confidence outside of your traditional borders. All of the technological advancements that we are experiencing right now is really intended to create more cross-border cooperation. Digital Pilipinas is the channel partner of Proxterra, the uh, global procurement arm of the MAS that is intended to create a safe space for entrepreneurs from all over the world to be able to trade in security and in trust. As a pioneer in e-commerce in electronics, my vision is to see every Filipino household having a gadget purchase from Kim Store. We share the same goal with Digital Pilipinas, pursuing the same mission, gathering talented individuals who can make a change and putting Philippines in the center of innovation. The Philippine e-commerce market is forecasted to be the fastest growing e-commerce market globally this year, growing by more than 25%. That has created a very dynamic part of the economy. It's powered by the marketplaces, and shop platforms powered by a whole network of enablers, by a whole community and a whole industry that is, uh, that is developing there to support e-commerce. And Digital Filipinas is bringing together a lot of those ecosystem stakeholders. And uh, as such, I'm very glad to be part of the Digital Filipinas movement that uh, helps to develop this uh, vibrant industry in the Philippines. The second work stream that we're championing in Digital Filipinas is the creation of an API-led economy. We're looking at launching an API marketplace that would allow for continuous innovation and continued connection between businesses and organizations here in the Philippines. An API-led economy is about unbundling products so that customers can access what they want, when they want it, at a competitive price. They can use APIs, connect to a startup that's specifically serving that community. And that's the power of the API-led economy. It allows the product and the providers and the users who are receiving and benefiting from that product to connect in ways they couldn't before. Financial inclusion is ensuring that we make financial services accessible and affordable to every individual and business in the country. It also allows us to educate and promote discovery on their own and assist them with the right services anywhere they are and anytime they need it. The third work stream that we're championing in Digital Pilipinas is all about micro-education and micro-certification. The way we look at education has tremendously changed throughout the years. No longer are kids committed to take a four, six, seven year course in university, and instead they're focusing on technological skills that are snackable and easy to acquire, immediately certifiable, and with your credentials being carried with you in the blockchain. We will be launching this year 
an internship program that would allow undergraduates or career shifters to be able to experience several corporations in one year so that by the time that they graduate from the internship or the fellowship program, they are Web 3.0 ready. We have to embrace the idea of micro-credentials, micro-certifications, or even micro-degrees. What it is really is learning less things and learning things faster. What we need to do together with Digital Philippines is create that bridge, that bridge that will address the skills gap in this new economy. For what skills you have now and what you need to do to get the skills you need tomorrow. So the way we see EdTech is really to solve not just one or two pain points, but really solve most of the pain points of the entire ecosystem. Um, and that's you know, really by pushing for digital learning and helping you know, both not just the students and their parents, but also the teachers, the schools, and all the institutions like government and corporates that are you know, working towards independent, well-trained, successful citizenry that can get the jobs and the careers that they want. Embracing digital opportunities requires developing new digital skills. There is no question about it. This means empowering learning, supporting public policies for reskilling and encouraging continuous improvements in, in, in that area. As we consider the challenges facing the world today, uh, we at Microsoft acknowledge the enormous responsibility we have to ensure that the technology we are building benefits everyone around us. Uh, and it has to be in line with our mission, which is to empower every person and every organization on the planet. And last but not the least is, of course, fintech, which is the fuel that fires all of these industries. We look at fintech not so much as a vertical, but rather a horizontal that powers various industries. During the pandemic, everyone talked about the uh, dramatic increase in digitalization and also in uh, digital transformation. A lot of what precipitated that was actually the movement of money. And the movement of money in those various verticals was brought about by fintech. In our case, we will ensure that fintech will continue to not just energize but revitalize legacy industries for the country. To have a, a, also a basis by which, you know, I used the word laymanize earlier, but by which you can laymanize the application of technology and understand the fact that you can only do so much relative to educating or, or, or telling uh, or, or basically increasing the level of financial literacy of people. So, so, you know, there can be an approach wherein it can be hybrid. There can be an approach by which, you know, we can be more patient about people not, not, uh, not ad adopting immediately. What FinTech did is they proved that the minimum digital hygiene of 24-7 accessibility, Six Sigma reliability, real-time transactions, safe and secure, was very possible. The use of mobiles and other devices allowed those services to be self-service in many ways. So that basically increased the accessibility of financial services to a broader set of the population. We recognize that not one company can make finance for all happen. We believe in the power of collaboration and how it could speed up inclusion. This will help us in our desire to empower communities because even the tiniest contribution adds up and has a snowball effect to create meaningful waves of impact in the country today. Digital Filipinas has been one of the strongest advocates for the use of technology in multiple industries in the Philippines. Now, for Philippines to be the center of cryptocurrency and blockchain, it's important that there are macro policies created that incentivizes companies to invest in Philippines. Secondly, the understanding of blockchain ecosystem and cryptocurrencies is included in the education syllabus. And last but not the least, the research and development around this technology is incentivized. The right timing, the right ingredients are all in place. We can truly start the beginning of our road to a digital Filipinas. Let's all build a cyber secure digital Filipinas. Together, let's build a digital Filipinas through open finance. Through e-commerce. Through edutech. Through fintech. Mabuhay ang digital Filipinas. Mabuhay. 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 Let's build a digital Pilipinas together.
amidst the vastness and diversity of the world. Somewhere in the Asia Pacific, you will find the Pearl of the Orient. Right here, the Philippines. Beyond its beaches and rich culture, here is Southeast Asia's second largest and youngest population with a literacy rate among the highest in the world. Here, the mobile penetration is incomparable. Here, internet users spend the most time online, the longest across the globe. Here is the social media capital of the world. Here, people are digitally adept and early adopters of new innovations. Here, businesses have accelerated their digital transformation and emerged into e-industries. This is all supported by world-class digital infrastructure, the Philippines' widest fiber optic network, an expansive submarine cable network and points of presence. and the largest data center network in the country. Here, across its more than 7,000 islands, making it the ideal digital market destination. Discover it here, only here, the Philippines. The RISE Challenge was inspired by the Barcelona Activa. It is a government initiative started in the 80s that gave support to entrepreneurs, a one-stop shop for startups. We chanced upon this when Makati officials went to Barcelona as part of their training for a program for smart cities run by the Development Academy of the Philippines. The officials were able to tour the internationally recognized tech hub, which was fully supported by the Barcelona city government as it was aimed to boost the local economy, provide innovation, and promote talent development. Through the RISE Challenge and Makati City's full support in this, Mayor Abi Binay hopes that the Philippines will rank higher in the startup international scene. Every billion dollar company today had to start somewhere. They were once a startup. Apple was once a startup. Google once a startup. Amazon once a startup. So you could say that it's very significant because the next big company, maybe not this year, maybe not even next year, but the future is in startups. So they really cannot be neglected. You have to develop them well. Our program focuses on the five aspects of finance, legal, marketing, team development, and effective pitching. We've gathered mentors who have a passion for sharing their knowledge and experiences. The Philippine Startup Survey in 2020 also identified that 47% of startups are family-funded. Outside of this group, most partnerships have not come into fruition due to mismatched visions with investors, chaotic business structures, and an unclear market target. After the program, the founders will have the opportunity to pitch their ideas to investors who share their vision. Our group knows what investors are looking for, and we know how to prepare the startup for funding. Maine is really a great place to find startups as we are seen as a premier and largest and most active angel investment association in the country. Maine members are expected to invest 1 million a year, which translate to 100 million annual deployable investment funds for startups. The support of the Makati LGU can be a very welcome strategic initiative Kudos to Ronin for partnering with them for this project. 
there are things government can provide which the private sector just can't. One area in which we can make a difference is supporting smart cities initiatives. It is so heartening to see Makati LGU and Ronin now playing an active role in supporting Philippine startups. On behalf of Mayor Abi Binay, the city of Makati would like to invite all creative Filipinos to bring your businesses here. We provide a competitive environment, fantastic co-working spaces, tax breaks, business registration assistance, and a reliable mentoring program. Makati will even take it further by giving you an equity-free grant of 500,000 pesos. Finally, we will give you an opportunity to fund your businesses by presenting you to qualified investors at the end of the program. Join us in the RISE Challenge. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mimi Young, and I'm honored to be hosting today's event, The Philippines Innovative Cities Teching Up the Country One City at a Time, brought to us by the Department of Trade and Industry Board of Investments, the City of Makati and RISE. This event serves as the official launch of Digital Filipinas in Innovative Cities Initiative, with the City of Makati as its pilot, and coincides with RISE. That's Resiliency, Innovation, Sustainability, and Entrepreneurship Challenge. We're also joined by the Department of Trade and Industry Board of Investments, or DTI BOI, because we believe that the startup ecosystem through smart cities has the power to transform the city of Makati into an investment hub for technology. To officially begin the program, may we now call in Ms. Amor Maklang, Digital Filipinas and World Fintech Festival convener, Fintech Philippines Association trustee and executive director, and Geyser Maklang co-founder. Let's all welcome Ms. Amor Maklang. Mimi, good morning. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Mabuhay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I can't begin to tell you how excited we are today uh, because as we move towards um, taking up the country one city at a time, the only way we can collectively increase our innovation and our technology quotient as a country is if we localize uh, the response to innovation and tech. Now, the DTI and the DICT have together launched the Digital Cities Program. And this, I have to say, is our inspiration for launching the Innovative Cities Program of the Digital Filipinas Movement. The Digital Filipinas Movement is currently the, uh, the largest private sector-led advocacy when it comes to teching up the country and building an ecosystem that's conducive to innovation and technology. Several years back, we have been touted as the uh, leading forerunner in the IT BPM industry. And this has actually given rise to the Digital Cities program, which has identified 25 locations and 31 cities as digital cities to serve as the most ideal host cities for IT BPM com companies outside of Metro Manila. Now, following in the footsteps of this program, we have seen that as early as 2018, it was actually reported that at least 5,800 active startups were operating across all major verticals in the ASEAN region, including e-commerce, fintech, enterprise solution, big data, web 3.0. Startups providing new products and services are growing from strength to strength across the region. And in our very own movement, we host two unicorns, Sendit and Gcash. And we know and believe with the Department of Trade and Industry that we can actually yield more. Digital Filipinas, our movement, yours and mine, 
to create a globally competitive technology and innovation ecosystem in the Philippines, connecting us with the rest of the world, is very proud and very honored to serve the objectives of the DTI and our government through our Digital Filipinas Innovative Cities. And this program is intended to collectively help raise our innovation quotient and technology ecosystem by plugging in the local players in the provinces and in the cities, not just to our national ecosystem, but to an ASEAN and to a global ecosystem. Together with all of our partners today, we look forward to creating regionally relevant solutions at the city and provincial level that can allow the plugging in seamlessly of our local, national, and international ecosystem. Early part of, uh, early part of the year, we uh, signed a partnership agreement with the Department of Science and Technology. Last February 24, we were with DOST PSERT and Secretary Boyd de la Pena. And our overall objective was to launch our uni university-based innovation hubs or technology business incubation. So we can continue to partner with our LGUs to localize in innovation solutions. Imagine the LGUs, the business communities, and the academic ecosystems all vaulting in to truly create a digital Filipinas. But for today, a city that's very near and dear to my heart, not just because this is the city that hosts my business where I live, and when we first came up with the brand, Make It Happen, Make It Makati, close to 10 years now. When we designed that brand, it was because we knew that this city hosts the leaders of the country. And what do leaders do? They make things happen. So Makati, as our pilot, could only be the logical, logical, decision to create this program. We are looking forward to creating a test and learn environment to inspire entrepreneurs to develop disruptive ideas and not to be afraid to take risks because we are supported not just by the national government through the DTI, the local government through the city of Makati in this their journey. We look forward to bringing to life and putting more details to the Innovation Startup Act, the Philippine Innovation Act, the ease of doing business, and among the many other innovations that have been pioneered by this tech progressive administration. I'm so grateful to uh, Dr. Fita, you said Fita to all of us, but Dr. Fita Aldaba of the DTI. Ma'am, just a few weeks back, I was actually with PIDS. I was uh, uh, commenting on a panel on FinTech and everyone was so thrilled when I mentioned uh, uh, our collaboration, they said, Yusak Fita is from PIDS Amar. So everyone is like super proud. We look forward to collaborating with you to actualize the potential of the LGU-based innovation centers to support not just our BPO industry, but also create support for nascent technologies that could yield employment immediately. I could not emphasize enough that in certain nascent technologies, for example, like certified ethical hacking or blockchain development, there is absolutely zero unemployability. Can you imagine that? Blockchain, open finance, APIs, crypto, and others. 
where, by the way, the Philippines is lording it in the world. So as we send off Yusat Pita on yet another rainbow tour to, to promote the Philippines um, in the United States, we give her as pabaon the fact that the Philippines is one of the leading, not just fintech players, but crypto and play to earn champions in the world. And this is something we all should be proud of. They say it takes a village to raise a kid. I think it's the same. It takes a city one at a time to build a digital Filipinas. We are so grateful for the pioneering work that has been done by our partners, the Ronin Group of Companies, and of course, the pilot project, the Rise Challenge. Special shout out to Ms. Yanni de Guzman, and of course, our mama for promoting the Philippines to the rest of the world, Yusak Fita Aldaba. And because this is Women's Month, special shout out to the mommy of Makati, Mayor Mayora Abibinay, and hopefully what will be the blueprint for building innovative cities in the Philippines. We are at the beginning of this journey, and it's not going to be, it's not going to be easy at all. You said, Krita, we look forward to supporting you in terms of granular work, such as a research that can help bridge the skills and knowledge gap amongst the cities as they build their innovation hubs. We also look forward to helping promote uh, the Philippines as a nascent technology hub, not just in the Philippines, but also across the world. You have our wholehearted support. We are looking forward for the start of this advocacy, which can then lead up to a summit with the various LGUs as we look forward to taking up our country. In our next event in April, in June and in November, we will be featuring other case studies of city states that have actually teched up successfully. They will be Tel Aviv, also Singapore and Taiwan. Thank you very much. Mabuhay po kayong lahat. Mabuhay po ang city of Makati, ang DTI, at lalong lalo na po ang isang digital Pilipinas. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Amor. I think we have a video coming up, the Digital Filipinas 2022 video. Let's watch this. Digital Filipinas is the largest private sector-led movement to build an ecosystem for innovation and technology for the country. And our hope is to not just take on some of the largest problems of the Philippines that are addressable with technology, but collectively to raise our innovation quotient as a country. We are experiencing a technology renaissance here in the Philippines, where the best and brightest from all over the world are actually choosing to domicile themselves here in the Philippines. Now what we're seeing is an influx of global technology talents choosing to headquarter themselves here in the Philippines because we have the greatest talent for it. We have a killer ecosystem, the most enabling regulators. So the formula for success to build a great technology business is here in the Philippines. Digital Filipinas as a movement represents the most expansive industry-driven effort to bring together the champions of emerging technologies with the business leaders who are committed to transforming the landscape. It is our honor and privilege to once again co-convene 
digital Filipinas. Let the world feel the excitement as our nation becomes a center for innovation. This year, we have four priority areas. Number one is MSME digitalization and e-commerce. The ultimate objective is to be able to trade in trust and in confidence outside of your traditional borders. All of the technological advancements that we are experiencing right now is really intended to create more cross-border cooperation. Digital Pilipinas is the channel partner of Proxterra, the uh, global procurement arm of the MAS that is intended to create a safe space for entrepreneurs from all over the world to be able to trade in security and in trust. As a pioneer in e-commerce in electronics, my vision is to see every Filipino household having a gadget purchase from Kim Store. We share the same goal with Digital Pilipinas, pursuing the same mission, gathering talented individuals who can make a change and putting Philippines in the center of innovation. The Philippine e-commerce market is forecasted to be the fastest growing e-commerce market globally this year, growing by more than 25%. That has created a very dynamic part of the economy. It's powered by the marketplaces, and shop platforms powered by a whole network of enablers, by a whole community and a whole industry that is, uh, that is developing there to support e-commerce. And Digital Filipinas is bringing together a lot of those ecosystem stakeholders. And uh, as such, I'm very glad to be part of the Digital Filipinas movement that uh, helps to develop this uh, vibrant industry in the Philippines. The second work stream that we're championing in Digital Filipinas is the creation of an API-led economy. We're looking at launching an API marketplace that would allow for continuous innovation and continued connection between businesses and organizations here in the Philippines. An API-led economy is about unbundling products so that customers can access what they want, when they want it, at a competitive price. They can use APIs, connect to a startup that's specifically serving that community. And that's the power of the API-led economy. It allows the product and the providers and the users who are receiving and benefiting from that product to connect in ways they couldn't before. Financial inclusion is ensuring that we make financial services accessible and affordable to every individual and business in the country. It also allows us to educate and promote discovery on their own and assist them with the right services anywhere they are and anytime they need it. The third work stream that we're championing in Digital Pilipinas is all about micro-education and micro-certification. The way we look at education has tremendously changed throughout the years. No longer are kids committed to take a four, six, seven-year course in university, and instead they're focusing on technological skills that are snackable and easy to acquire, immediately certifiable, and with your credentials being carried with you in the blockchain. We will be launching this year an internship program that would allow undergraduates or career shifters to be able to experience several corporations in one year so that by the time that they graduate from the internship or the fellowship program, they are Web 3.0 ready. We have to embrace the idea of micro-credentials, micro-certifications, or even micro-degrees. What it is really is learning less things and learning things faster. What we need to do together with Digital Philippines is create that bridge, that bridge that will address the skills gap in this new economy. For what skills you have now and what you need to do to get the skills you need tomorrow. So the way we see EdTech is really to solve not just one or two pain points, but really solve most of the pain points of the entire ecosystem. Um, and that's you know, really by pushing for digital learning and helping you know, both not just the students and their parents, but also the teachers, the schools, and all the institutions like government and corporates that are you know, working towards independent, well-trained, successful citizenry that can uh, get the jobs and the careers that they want. Embracing digital opportunities requires developing new digital skills. There is no question about it. This means empowering learning, supporting public policies for reskilling and encouraging continuous improvements in, in, in that area. 
as we consider the challenges facing the world today, uh, we at Microsoft acknowledge the enormous responsibility we have to ensure that the technology we are building benefits everyone around us. Uh, and it has to be in line with our mission, which is to empower every person and every organization on the planet. And last but not the least is, of course, fintech, which is the fuel that fires all of these industries. We look at fintech not so much as a vertical, but rather a horizontal that powers various industries. During the pandemic, everyone talked about the uh, dramatic increase in digitalization and also in uh, digital transformation. A lot of what precipitated that was actually the movement of money. And the movement of money in those various verticals was brought about by fintech. In our case, we will ensure that fintech will continue to not just energize, but revitalize legacy industries for the country. To have a, a, also a basis by which, uh, you know, I used the word laymanize earlier, but by which you can laymanize the application of technology and understand the fact that we can only do so much relative to educating or, or, or telling uh, or, or basically increasing the level of financial literacy of people. So, so, you know, there can be an approach wherein it can be hybrid. There can be an approach by which, you know, we can be more patient about people not, not, uh, not ad adopting immediately. What FinTech did is they proved that the minimum digital hygiene of 24-7 accessibility, Six Sigma reliability, real-time transactions, safe and secure, was very possible. The use of mobiles and other devices allowed those services to be self-service in many ways. So that basically increased the accessibility of financial services to a broader set of the population. We recognize that not one company can make finance for all happen. We believe in the power of collaboration and how it could speed up inclusion. This will help us in our desire to empower communities because even the tiniest contribution adds up and has a snowball effect to create meaningful waves of impact in the country today. Digital Filipinas has been one of the strongest advocate for the use of technology in multiple industries in Philippines. Now, for Philippines to be the center of cryptocurrency and blockchain, it's important that there are macro policies created that incentivizes companies to invest in Philippines. Secondly, the understanding of blockchain ecosystem and cryptocurrencies is included in the education syllabus. And last but not the least, the research and development around this technology is incentivized. The right timing, the right ingredients are all in place. We can truly start the beginning of our road to a digital Filipinas. Let's all build a cybersecure digital Filipinas. Together, let's build a digital Pilipinas through open finance. Through e-commerce. Through edutech. Through fintech. Mabuhay ang digital Pilipinas. Mabuhay. 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 Let's build a digital Pilipinas together. Digital Pilipinas for all indeed. We're looking forward to see more of your initiatives this year. Now let's move forward with our program. We're graced by the presence of our keynote speaker, the Department of Trade and Industry Undersecretary Fita Aldaba. Uh, Dr. Rafaela, Rafaelita Fita M. Aldaba is Undersecretary of the Competitiveness and Innovation Group of DTI. While also serving as a governor of the Philippine Board of Investments or BOI, she is leading DTI's initiatives in preparing industries for the fourth industrial revolution and digital transformation, establishing regional inclusive innovation centers, developing new creative industries, and growing a robust startup ecosystem. Yusek Fita, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Mimi. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. If I may just be allowed to uh, share my screen very quickly. Uh, are you able to see my uh, my screen? Hope you yes, can. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, thank you, Amor. That was really a very inspiring message. 
And it's a great pleasure to be here to share the work that the Department of Trade and Industry, particularly the Competitiveness and Innovation Group is doing in the innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship area. And uh, at the outset, I would like to say that as we create the enabling environment to grow globally competitive and innovative industries, our new industrial policy, which is the Philippine Inclusive Innovative Industrialization or IQBS, is focusing on science, technology, and innovation. We view these new technologies as drivers to achieve an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable industrial development. Using new technologies like AI, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics, and advanced manufacturing, including Internet of Things, blockchain, industrial biotech, cloud computing, advanced materials, micro and nano electronics, satellite and cognitive technologies. We can create new products or solutions, particularly in the following areas, smart buildings, advanced manufacturing, precision agriculture, digital health, vehicle technology, and resilient technology. DTI initiatives are geared towards helping our companies shift to industry transformation. We see digital transformation as a journey towards embracing a culture of innovation in all facets of production, people, technology, and organization. Our most recent initiative, as you can see on the slide, is the Artificial Intelligence Roadmap, which focuses on uplifting the lives of our people, industries, and the economy. By adopting AI, we can tap vast opportunities to help us maintain the regional and global competitiveness of industries, prepare the future workforce for the jobs of the future, and attract large companies to set up in the Philippines. And as you can see on the slide, over 50 tech startups in the country are already using AI as a core technology. To accelerate innovation and MSME digitalization, one of the major recommendations of the roadmap is the building of a center for AI research. The center is going to be a public-private partnership and would serve as hub for data scientists and researchers to perform collaborative AI R&D, provide uh, consultancy services, create AI tech products, conduct literacy programs, and attract leading global firms to set up their R&D activities in the Philippines. Our areas of focus include um, precision farming, along with smart manufacturing, healthcare services, AI-powered BPO, smart cities, and resilient technology. As Amor mentioned, the Philippine startup ecosystem is composed of a young, energetic, tech-savvy population brimming with potential, a vibrant community of highly skilled and innovative individuals. And amid the pandemic, many Filipino startups were able to quickly pivot to new activities and using new technologies, they provided solutions to help government in addressing pandemic issues. The acceleration of digital transformation paved the way for the growth of the digital economy in the Philippines. The country's revenue in the internet economy is estimated at 17 billion US dollars in 2021, with revenues projected to reach 25 billion US dollars by 2025. The adoption of AI is also expected to create revenues amounting to 92 billion US dollars. That's 12% of our GDP by 2030. So amid the pandemic, local fintech startups increased their volume of transactions and uh, raised funding for expansion. And we saw actually our first unicorn fintech company mint with a value of over 2 billion US dollars. There were other startups uh, that were able to uh, raise funding during, uh, during the past two years. Um, more notable would be companies like uh, Voyager Innovations, which raised uh, 167 million US dollars, Kumu raised 73.6 million US dollars, and many more. So um, the, the DTI has actually launched three, in, uh, three programs, incubation and acceleration 
uh, programs that address specific startup concerns in their growth journey. The startup idea, uh, uh, you can see those, uh, th these programs on the slide. The first one is idea, then we have advanced, and then the, the third one is the gap. Idea and advance are designed to help early stage startups grow towards bringing their products to the market. And we also have uh, a program called the Startup Venture Fund. This is uh, in collaboration with the National Development Company. We are uh, implementing this program with an initial funding of uh, 500 million uh, pesos together with venture capitalists and other co-investment partners. And uh, through the ILIP program, we partner with other government agencies and the private sector to provide opportunities and assistance to startups and startup enablers, particularly in participating in local and international startup events. And leveraging on our network of traditional businesses, we are also implementing the Smart Link program to connect our traditional MSMEs and large enterprises with startups that can provide digital solutions for their operations. We are building regional inclusive innovation centers to connect startups with government agencies and the business sector and accelerate the commercialization of their products and services. These innovation centers serve as venues for design thinking workshops, along with networking and engagement with the academe and industry. We are currently supporting eight regional inclusive innovation centers in the country located in major cities like Cebu, Davao, and Cagayan de Oro. And let me also mention, to continue to inspire innovation and foster collaboration, we hold an annual Philippine Startup Week, which is the country's biggest startup and innovation conference. And we hope, Amor, you could join us in uh, this year's uh, Philippine Startup Week. Well, um, Another advocacy, of course, is uh, our promotion of creative cities. Creative uh, cities really are agents of the creative economy. They are key to our recovery and uh, resilience, and they also play a, a, a critical role in creating an environment for the creative economy to be more innovative and transformative, and thus uh, unleashing their maximum potential. Um, we've just finished uh, the formulation of two creative city playbooks. Those uh, were made for Baguio City and Cebu City, both of which uh, have been designated as UN, UNESCO Creative Cities Network, part of the, as part of the network. So as a young ecosystem, we are facing a lot of challenges, but our vision is clear, and that is to make the Philippine tech startup ecosystem an engine of economic recovery, inclusive growth, and job creation. To realize this, we keep our focus on growing the number of startups, increasing early stage funding, building startup quality, bolstering uh, founder know-how, strengthening their market reach, and expanding our global connectedness by engaging with foreign partners through investment and knowledge exchange programs, especially among angel investors, VCs, startup founders, and enablers. The Philippines is home to a great pool of creative talents. Our startup ecosystem is relatively young. And as we have seen recently in the country, startups have emerged as key drivers of economic recovery and catalysts for disruptive innovation. And with innovation and collaboration, the Philippines can definitely rise as a top startup ecosystem. Thank you, and we look forward to collaborating with you, Digital Filipinas. Back to you, Mimi. Thank you so much for that presentation and for all that you do in DTI and for the country. You said, Fita, at this point, we'd like to do a photo op with the Undersecretary Fita and, of course, our esteemed panelists. May we call on our esteemed panelists later and you, Fita, to please switch on your cameras 
for a photo op, uh, Attorney Michael Kamina from the, uh, the City Legal Officer of Makati, uh, DK Representative Asak Napoleon Juanillo, please join us as well, Ms. Yanni de Guzman, the CEO and co-founder of Ronin Group, and of course, Ms. Amor Maklang of Digital Pilipinas. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn on your cameras and let's uh, do a quick photo op. Uh, on the count of three, let's say Digital Pilipinas and give your best smile. One, two, three. Digital Pilipinas. All right, I think we'll do one more quick picture taking. One, two, three, Digital Pilipinas. Digital Pilipinas. All right, I think we're good to go. Thank you so much again, Yusek Fida for that. I think we're now ready to move on to our um, panel discussion. I'm sure there are a lot of questions that our friends from the media would like to raise as well. At this point, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists for this morning. Attorney Michael Kamina is the City Legal Officer of Makati. Attorney Michael, thank you for joining us today. And to represent morning. DTI is ASEC Napoleon Juanilio. He's also from the Competitiveness and Innovation Group of DTI. Yusek, uh, ASEC Juanilio. Thank you for joining us. Please turn on your camera. And of course, Ms. Yanni de Guzman, the CEO and co-founder of Ronin Group of Companies. Hi, Ms. Yanni. Good morning. Good morning. And of course, joining us in the panel is Ms. Amor Maklang, convener of Digital Filipinas and World FinTech Festival and co-founder of Geyser Maklang. Hi, Amor. All right. So uh, for our friends in the media, please do share your questions. We try to address all of them uh, as soon as we can with the limited time that we have. But let me throw the first question in. And I wanna throw the first question to Amor, of course. Amor, what exactly do you mean by teching up a city? For Makati Zens, for example, how does a tech up Makati city work? Is it a smart city run by internet of things with smart grid, smart logistics, FinTech for everyone? And more importantly, why did Digital Filipinas launch this initiative? Thank you so much, uh, Mimi. Uh, a very, very loaded uh, uh, question indeed, but um, uh, you basically kind of drew up uh, what our roadmap is in a way. So the past two years, we've really been focusing on making sure that the Philippines is a relevant part of the conversation for digitalization especially as it pertains to nascent technologies and in the Web 3.0 discourse. So Web 3.0, as we all know by now, is the internet of money and the internet of trust. And um, I think to an extent, we can all agree that uh, the Philippines is a prominent uh, player when it comes to things like e-commerce, fintech, blockchain, crypto, uh, with some of the best and brightest uh, of these global founders choosing to be in the Philippines and making it its HQ. Now, I call it the Bibinka approach, right? Because I'm P Filipina through and through, and I love my food and my kakanin. So as we continue to heat up from the top, what we now need to do is ensure that the, um, uh, that the ground level is also prepped up. And um, the only way we can make sure that we deliver on this promise on a digital Filipinas is to ensure that the global and the national ecosystem is able to plug in seamlessly with the local ecosystem so that it's both a uh, bottoms up and a top down approach to digitalization. Also, we are federalist in every sense of the world, word rather, meaning the needs of a particular region, say in uh, region eight or region 12 in South Central Mindanao, will be very different from the needs of say region three in the Bulacan or the Cordillera area. It's innovation is not a one size fits all prescription. And what we need to make sure is that the local governments and also the academic institutions are all seamlessly tied together so that we don't have one center of excellence, but we have multiple centers of excellence. And I'm very proud of the fact that we have such uh, unobtrusive workers in government, super. So from the DOSP, 
with whom we have a partnership with, we are energizing and working with their TBIs or our university-based innovation hubs. So it's coming from that uh, um, nexus also. With USAC FITA, we look forward to collaborating with her, not just to promote the Philippines overseas, but to maybe give another important layer to their program on digital cities, which has been uh, pioneered by our antecedents uh, in the IT BPM industry. And that other equally important layer will be the capacitating of LGUs for Web 3.0. How does it look like? So a smart city, a digital city, and an innovative city can all have different work streams, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, uh, a smart city is all about interconnectivity. I was just with blockchain pioneer Ron Hose yesterday over lunch, and he said, Amor, you got to look into the technology in Israel of a transport company where in everything is on IoT. That is a very simplistic way of looking at a, um, uh, a smart city. You talked about payments and regulation. I am a big believer of blockchain technology as it pertains to being able to seamlessly make the governmental processes effortless, make it more transparent, uh, and to transact with integrity. So that's another layer. So that's where our fintech, the digitalization of our um, uh, core processes can come in. And this is where we also look forward to working with the DICT in terms of their advocacy for a cloud-first country. And then, of course, there is that enabling environment. So we have your local business chambers who may or may not be or is perhaps in different stages of digitalization. And we need to make sure that we're all on the same page so we can all move forward together. I'm sorry it was a long answer, but it was a truly loaded question. It's a very comprehensive plan that you have there, Amor. It's a very holistic one at that. I want to go to Yanni and Attorney Kamina now. Why was Makati chosen as the pilot city for this initiative? I know for Amor, it's a bit of a personal reason as well because it is her home, the ho it's hosting her advocacies. But why Makati for you too? Um, why do you think, Yanni, it makes sense to start this in Makati? Well, why not, right? Because Makati City remains to be the top local startup destination. Mm. So it's the country's prime business district and financial hub accounted for about 29% of the total deal volume. Next would be Taguig, Pasig, and then Quezon City. Um, specifically, we start also with Mayor Abby, um, not just because she was the easiest, like we shared the same vision at our first meeting, but her track record has in has been very good in promoting businesses. Um, she has this vision in making Makati a smart city. Mm -hmm. So she jump-started the city's transformation through a series of public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, she created the Makati Z card, Makati Z app, the Makati public Wi-Fi system. So she's very advanced already. So it was um, a very easy conversation when we um, approached this a program up to her. Before, before we go to Attorney Kamina, Yanni, after Makati, which city is next? Which city, which other city looks prime for the picking? Perhaps from Visayas and Mindanao, are you eyeing any specific cities there? Well, anything goes, right? Um, this is sort of a coming soon. You just have to uh, wait for it. Um, but for um, beyond Metro Manila, the Cities that are really ripe for picking would be Davao and Cebu. You know, Cagayan de Oro, Baguio, um, and Bacolod, their, they, their startup industry has already been booming. Um, and you can see this in the studies that um, DPI has created in partnership with the other enablers. So these are um, cities that we're also looking into. All right. Exactly. Uh, uh, maybe, yes, go do you ahead. mind if I just add quickly to that? Uh, thank you so much, Yanni amazing partnership here that just started. Um, two things, no? We are not going to recreate the wheel in the Digital Filipinas Innovative Cities Program, and we will be working very closely with Ronan in this journey. Uh, between our partnership with the DOSD and also our forthcoming partnership with the DTI, 
uh, we are going to start off with the 25 Digital Cities Program that has mm -hmm. been earmarked. Uh, and then we are going to put that side by side with the programs of the DOST. So looking at the city readiness and also at the same time, the academic readiness. So when you bring those two things together, the Venn diagram for at least those two filters will become our pilot projects for. But you are absolutely right, Mimi. It's going to be definitely in Visayas and also in Mindanao. Look at places, for example, like Iligan. Would you know that some of the top uh, engineering schools in the world are actually in Iligan, in MSU for one? Um, so it's definitely going to be uh, uh, very inclusive and it will look at those two filters, LGU and the universities. Thank you. Thank you for that. Amor, Attorney Michael, um, I wanted to ask, so they picked Makati as the pilot city. What does Makati have to offer uniquely? What is, what is your edge, you think? Well, what are you uh, offering your investors, your startup entrepreneurs? Well, um, I, I think, first of all, we have the infrastructure needed for, for this um, uh, for this program to, to start with. So we have the, uh, as Yanni had mentioned already, we have the Wi-Fi um, system mm -hmm. already set up. This was one of the first uh, projects that we had to go through. So to ensure that um, we really will be a smart city. So without the necessary infrastructure, it will be useless to promote oneself as a digital or a smart city. So Mayor Abby's first um, project for the day was really to set up the infrastructure needed uh, by any uh, startup company or any uh, company which w wishes to focus itself on technology. Now, uh, after that, uh, we're here uh, with, we, this, this was a great opportunity uh, for the city of Makati to partner with uh, Ronin and Digital Pilipinas and as well to be able to promote also the education on the part of mm. the uh, startup so we have the University of Makati, which has always been a school uh, focused on practical uh, learning and uh, uh, immediate uh, results for, for its students. So this was a great opp opportunity for that. But to top it off, we will be giving a uh, 500,000 uh, incentive for, for those who will be able to um, be, who will be selected in this program. It's an equity-free grant from the city of Makati to help things uh, move uh, for the startup companies that will be chosen. So aside from that, we will also be coming up with other incentive programs um, under our incentive code. So attorney, you already started to talk about the, the RICE challenge. Uh, there's gonna be a pitching competition, a qualifying round and eight startups will be selected, correct? And the eight startups to be selected will get the, what you mentioned the 500,000 equity free grant plus training mentorship with Ronin so Yanni at this point could you tell us more about the Ronin group and how the Ronin dojo is tying up to the rice challenge as you tech up Makati city well, um, the Ronin partnered with Makati um, basically to give the 500,000 equity grant to uh, equity free grant to startups. So this pitching, yes, you look around, there are a lot of pitching competitions, right? And you see a lot of them and you think that after the pitching competition, when they get their money, uh, what do, do these startups do? And most of them, they buy a MacBook or they buy an iPhone uh, telephone and they spend the money. So what we want to do is to create sustainable businesses. Um, the Ronin and also the Makati and Digital Pilipinas, we created this program um, so that we can get all of these creative minds together, give them a pitching competition, and then also give them the financial aid. A lot of incubators that exist today, and there are very good ones, a lot of them are really good ones here, especially in Makati. They assume that a lot of um, the startups and their founders can survive a year of incubation without earning any salaries. So this is so difficult for them, right? Um, you're expected to attend school and programs and develop your business without earning 
anything. And this becomes a challenge for a lot of startups and it really will delay their success. What we hope to do is by providing the financial aid or by giving the grant, we, can, we give them a mentoring program where we'll, we will be teaching all of these things to them. And this, um, the, my, the, the grant will be given in um, when they reach um, certain milestones. So one would be, for example, a registration in Makati. Then they will be given uh, uh, the grant of um, part of the grant. And this is to ensure that the grant that is being given is assisting them in creating sustain a sustainable business, right? Because we, we are really invested in their success. And after the grant, when everything is already, uh, after the mentoring program, when everything is already completed, then when they're pitching, uh, deck is also done, when we've already taught them the proper way to, uh, to pitch, the proper way to develop their team, um, the, prob the proper way to reach their um, market target. Um, also, when we teach them everything in, in legal, in starting a business, and also especially the financial structure, which we notice in a lot of pitching competitions is what is lacking, no? it's the weak link. Then we, uh, we show them or give them an opportunity to pitch um, in front of a lot of um, qualified investors. So that is the, the main gist of this um, program. We're really invested in really assisting the startup from their idea to um, funding. And to raising fundings and getting more investors. Uh, ASEC Nap Juanilio, I wanted to throw this next question to you. With all the things that DTI is doing to lay the groundwork for RICS, for example, competitiveness policies, among others, to contribute you know, to building innovative cities. As an entrepreneur yourself, how do you envision the startup ecosystem in the next five years? How is it looking? Yeah, uh, thank, thanks a lot, Mimi. And you know, first of all, I'd like to really express appreciation for the ideas uh, articulated by Amor, you know, uh, because they are basically, they resonate with some of the um, things that we're now actually doing in the regions in the well we call it the regional inclusive innovation centers and you know when we started with this or more i think uh prior to even joining dti i was senior advisor to usaid stride project and that we were really just thinking about sort of a just <laughs> it's almost like how do i call it it's just like replicating grad school uh environment you know, just having a party and having really uh, knowing where to go, who to go to, when to go to, what to go for, all of those things that, you know, it's, it's like if you have an idea and you want to kind of validate it with uh, somebody else, but knowing exactly where the laboratories are, where the experts are, and who can help you with what. And it doesn't necessarily mean that just because it's a regional inclusive innovation that everything has to be parochial within the region. You can call a friend from another region or even uh, the diaspora community if, if you want it. In fact, the way we've always been looking at at least uh, you talk about the Venn diagram. Of course, in the RICS, there are other stakeholders, there are other actors, the DOST, the DICT, CHED, DEPED, TESDA. Each of those, say, each of those agencies and other private stakeholders, they bring in their own charism or gifts to the RICS. And for the DTI, you know, we call it a way to kind of whisper where the markets are and what are the market requirements, what are the customer preferences, how do we forecast exactly where customers would be, or even anticipate. That's the reason why we call it sometimes disruptive innovation. But the, 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 the thing is that, you know, as an academic myself, you know, if the customer wants it red and you happen and, it, and you happen to have a yellow bag, for instance, then at least the chemist and the material scientists can turn it into yellow. You know, I remember very well going to this hub in, in Toronto in Ryerson University. It's like a 15 story hub of students where the, where the ground floor is just exactly where they meet and every every floor they go to is that as they improve on their ideas they practically meet you know so-called student colleagues who can basically transform their ideas into uh, physically something else you know but 
but that's the idea of the RICs, you know. And having said that, you know, each one, of course, carries its own agenda, but the the the, the collaborativeness, the openness to the ideas and and the fun and the creativity should actually emanate from those uh, tight communities because we're hoping that because they are from the regions, they probably know well, of course, the the pain points of those uh, of, of the stakeholders in the regions. And so uh, that's that's the whole um, idea to make it much more thriving. And that's the reason why when you do talk about local business chambers or LGUs and other local actors, that's exactly what we want to happen. So we're very appreciative of, of this, of course, localizing it. Like for instance, starting with Makati doesn't really matter. If, uh, if, if, it, if it can be modeled as such, then why not? And, uh, and cascade it, evangelize it in other uh, cities like Davao, CDO, Iligan, like Amor was saying, and we do have friends in Iligan who are great physicists, great uh, data scientists and engineers, et cetera. You know, um, they, they have all the smarts and the goods with them to uh, basically transform a product. And, and, and hence, I think even when working with state universities and colleges, we're saying that perhaps it's time for them, and I hope, you know, even with UST, it's time for them to look at more market-driven hypothesis testing, starting where customers are, or starting where the markets are, instead of coming up with a hypothesis that's like, oh, I'm interested in this one, you know, but is there a market for that? You know, there's a market for that in the library shelves, yeah. But that, that's not exactly what we mean. Um, I think uh, I think it's almost like if you can make Stanford's or Berkeley's or Cornell's or MIT's out of all of this, and a lot of us, you know, we're we're from those schools too. So we we do know how we've experienced it. We do know how to to kind of just rev up the environment and make sure that it also happens. So yeah, I I am with you guys here and translating it into policies and you know government works if i want to get, if if we do have all of these smarts too in the government it really works and uh, and and, and I, we, we we want to be able to translate this into policies to be able to really come up also with doable and actionable plans and um, you know as uh, amor was saying Internet of money, internet of trust, you know, coming up with all of these localized solutions. That's exactly what we want them to experiment on, have fun, be comfortable in the failures of it, and um, be, be more risk, uh, be more of a risk taker and manage also the risk in the, in the process. I think that's exactly what we want, the kind of value orientations that we're inculcating in in the regional inclusive innovation centers. Thank you for that, Asak Nap. And speaking of the internet of money and the internet of trust, Amor, what role does FinTech play in, you know, creative, innovative, will adopting emerging technologies like cryptocurrency, blockchain, open finance play in creating a real, a real smart city? Asak Nap. So good to see you, right? Uh, um, okay, going back to uh, going back to fintech. Um, you know, Mimi, we look at fintech as not just a vertical, but rather as the fuel that powers various industries, various cities. In the pandemic, we've seen that the industries that have allowed for the free flowing of money it thrived, right? So exponential growth in uh, the payment space, open finance, digital banks, certain industries with love for the free flow of money, e-money, digital money, then it almost choked up and died, i.e. education, right? For example. Now, what we need to be able to do is cut through all of the fat and the layers and the bureaucracy and the best way to be able to scale it is actually through technology and fintech. Now, if you would allow me, um, my mentor and our chairman in the Fintech Philippines Association, the father of fintech in the country, Dr. Tito Ortiz, 
uh, of Union Bank would always remind me, Amor, it's not the technocrats on top nor people here in this webinar who will be the best person to solve the problems in the regions. At the end of the day, it's the people on the spot. And he was actually loosely quoting Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom regarding invoking of the people on the spot. So the DTI and that of the DOST who recognizes that it is the power of the people locally who can solve the problems and technology being merely an enabler, then what's to stop us from being one of the top innovation in digital countries in the world? All right, thank you thank for you, that, Bibi. Amor. And speaking of knowing what the problems are on the ground, what needs to be addressed, I mean, here is the hammer, where are the nails, in that sort of way. I want to ask Attorney Kamina, you know, Makati City has been a central, traditionally a, a central business district and a BPO hub here in the Philippines. How will further teching up the city benefit the businesses in Makati and the BPO sector there? I mean, are there specific choke points, pain points in the way business is done in the city, in the city hall, in the city government that you think tech can provide solutions for? Could you cite concrete examples? Okay, well, uh, with regard to the use of technology, uh, we started last year, especially because of the pandemic, uh, updating our systems for um, uh, online um, access to city hall uh, transactions. So we had the online uh, payment of uh, property taxes, of business taxes. If, uh, mm. As long as there are no issues, it can be done uh, quickly online and uh, payment can be done as well online. It took us a while actually to be able to implement the payment online system because at first the Commission of Audit was really uh, worried about the um, th these kinds of transactions because uh, as far as they're concerned, it must be done immediately. And of course, we, we know uh, in the banking system there are floats. So but eventually, I guess the, the pandemic really helped it. <laughs> they also um, accepted our uh, um, explanation for, for it. So we have the online uh, payment system and we have the uh, for booking in our hospital na Makati. You have an online appointment system, which is being done also in other private hospitals. So uh, aside from these projects, we, are, we know that there are so many other things that can be thought of by uh, people by the like uh, what was mentioned the uh, people on the ground really so that's why this project is really important yeah. so that we get to hear um, these people uh, get them to pitch their ideas and then if it's really worth uh, supporting we will be able to uh, support them not just through the grant but also through uh, further education as provided by the mentoring of Ronin and then of course um, we will be able to market th their activity so it's really, we're, we're not saying that we know everything. In fact, we're saying that, hey, we, we don't know uh, what else we can do. So uh, pitch to us your ideas and we'll help you through, through this. All right. Before we get to the pitch of ideas in the competition, uh, Attorney Michael, here's a question from Melvin Kalimag of News Bites. Is it possible for you to waive some of the requirements for business permits for startups? Other LGUs require garbage fees, medical fire extinguishers when startups don't even have offices. Can you waive these basic requirements? Well, uh, these are all provided by law. Um, so, uh, but we will be able to assist them by allowing them to have uh, virtual offices and still register in the city of Makati. Maybe they can use uh, some of our own office spaces uh, while they are um, starting their, their company. And then eventually when they're established, they, then that's the time that they'll have to move out. But then during the program, we will be able to, be able to provide them uh, an office space and a uh, room for them to use hmm. for their uh, business. All right. Uh, here's a question for Yanni. You know, we understand this initiative is taking place alongside the Rise Challenge. Can we ask you what prizes are at stake um, for those who win from the pitching competition? Eight startups will win. What do they get aside from the money? Well, 
to add with what um attorney Camille said earlier um with regards to the co-working spaces we were sponsored by Draper House so Draper House has a co-working space located in Poblacion where the qualified startups who win the pitching competition can actually uh, convene there and hold their um can have can have their make that as their um address if they if they want to. They even have lodging for the startups. Now this pitching competition is not just for the Makati citizens. This is for all Filipinos. The location is just in Makati. The basic requirement is just that you register your business here. So your business address could be the co-working space, the Draper House, it's up to you. And there are a lot of virtual um, offices around. Or, but you could be located in whatever part of the Philippines you want to be in. The other um, prizes included is um, we are giving Amazon credits. We're also giving uh, some gadgets. So we're also providing co-working spaces um, and also the 500,000 um, equity free grant. Um, there's, with that also is registration for your business assistance. Uh, we, Makati has their one-stop shop. They also have, uh, we have a lot of sponsors, right? Um, so it's so, it's a lot um, that I can't go through all of them right now. But mainly for a startup, this is what's really important because a lot of startups really can't afford first um, to rent an office. So that would be very important for them. So we know that for startups, the beginning, at least we have, we're not lacking uh, creative ideas out there. In fact, a lot of Filipinos are really innovators. We just have to financially assist them, give them the, the structure so that they can succeed. And this is what the program is giving. And of course, introduce them to the right people. Yes, the invest and qualified investors. There are a lot of um, pitching pitching sessions out there where the the um, investors are not really qualified. So mm -hmm. we would like to make sure that these are serious angel investors and also VCs mm -hmm. um, and also individuals who we are presenting the startups to. All right. Thank you, Yanni. Here's a question uh, for Amor. And this question is from Ger Gregory Bautista of Malaya. Digital learning, as you explained it, Amor, he says, it's perfect. In the past, such actions have been done or advocated, but not with the same precision as you plan to do. But many companies, even those that claim to be digitalized, continue to use legacy methods for vetting candidates, including qualifications such as age, completion of a college education, and et cetera. Even the solution to use blockchain, something he personally experienced enrolling and studying in a North American college seems to be misunderstood by local companies. How do you intend to solve this in digital Filipinas? Thank you so much for that question. Um, for starters, we don't know if we're going to solve it, but allow us to share with you what the small pilot we've started. Because what we have really been doing in Digital Filipinas is create pilots with some of the leading ecosystem builders and players, not just in the Philippines, but in the world. So we bring in the best and the brightest, both overseas and in the Philippines, top companies, top investors, top technologists, and then we work on small pilots and small projects. So going, to your, going back to your question on education, last November, last, uh, Q4 of 2020, uh, 2021, within the Digital Philippines Academy, we rolled out an education certification uh, on the micro, on micro certificates. So these are Web 3.0 learnings, basics like interoperability, API, cloud, et cetera. All the uh, basics of Web 3.0 in but number one, biteable sizes. 30 minutes at most, one hour, two hours, that when you all finish can ladder up into a certificate, right? So I don't believe that the traditional system of three, four, two-year courses are relevant anymore, not even three or six months, right? To support what the DTI, the DTI wants, how can we have technology and solutions that immediately translate into um, applications and employability? So the first is the truncating of the process. It's all asynchronous. It's all digital. 
And it's all in micro bites, small snackable that you can ladder up to a certificate. Then you talked about blockchain. How do we know, for example, that the um, 100 plus people listening here or those many more listening on the Facebook Live learn something from this talk? So what we do, the testing is now going to be on a platform that is on the blockchain. So our partner uh, in Digital Filipinas with the support of Oxygen, uh, the MASS Oxygen is Affinity. Affinity is the uh, blockchain platform of Temasek. So essentially all your credits, your credentials are going to stay with you immutably on the blockchain. And you can either have that sent over to an employer or put on LinkedIn in order to prevent what I call a digital recto. No disrespect intended po sa mga taga recto, no? but for those of you who are watching outside of the country, when we affectionately say the term, your diploma came from recto, it has a certain negative implication. So in order to prevent a digital recto from happening, your credentials have to be on the blockchain. So, and then last but not the least, an important component in our education, Digital Filipinas Academy, is a system of internship and fellowship. So whether you are an upskiller or an undergraduate or someone who wants to be exposed to this, we will put you on a one-year rotation across various industries, fintech, technology, regulators, etc., and the intent here is for you to get exposed to what's happening here in the Philippines. So quick, snackable courses, immutably your credentials are on the blockchain, and then real-life practical applications. Those three tenets are what comprises Digital Filipinas Academy. Thank you for that, more. The next question is, how do you sell it? How do you encourage Filipinos to get into this initiative, ASIC NAP of DTI? What do you think are the things we can do, that DTI can do to foster the entrepreneurial and innovative mindset? You know, unfortunately, so many young Filipinos today think that technologies equal social media, but it's more than social media. How do you nurture the correct mindset, you know, that we learn you know, the first principles, as Elon Musk calls it, we, we play with the concepts, we disassemble, we assemble, we build something new, groundbreaking tech initiatives, and not just another Me Too invention. Yeah, now, you know what? Um, actually, I, I, it's, kind of, it's kind of difficult for me to approach this question from where I sit because I... I I am an I am a scientist myself, a researcher, a scholar. Now I'm, but let's let's start first with um, more uh, uh, I should say more more sizable slices. I like first first of all, let me start with what Amor had said about truncating the skills enhancement, and then coming up with ladderized pathways so that immediately we can have all of those uh, human resources and then much needed human capital for them to engage in the innovation space. I think that is good. Um, having said that, um, and I, I think that also kind of uh, demystify this whole uh, innovation bit. Um, if we do have, let's say somebody who is already a college grad, but is in uh, need of certain skills and you know, what kind of ladderized programs do we have that uh, the, the, the word that uh, more used was quick and snappable courses. You know, I'm, I'm all for that because I think uh, those actors are also needed uh, to uh, in, in, the, in the whole uh, ecosystem. But this doesn't mean that we also don't need the domain experts. We do need the domain experts. We do need more or less the primary knowledge generators or the knowledge producers, et cetera. But you know, like what, um, USEC Twitter and I had this conversation with the National uh, Academy of Science and Technology, and even the scientists, you know, are saying that when we come up, let's say, with agro fishery solutions, you know, um, uh, we don't necessarily have to have a PhD fully engaged in the whole thing. You know, it's possible to have. Uh, human capital that's trained at the level of, let's say, managing the greenhouses. So you can have a snappable 
<laughs> quick snappable course on greenhouse technology or a quick snappable course on on, on tilapia uh, farming etc cetera, etc cetera. That, that that kind of thing so sometimes i think you have to take a look at the the human capital along the continuum you might need the human capital and the human resources with the advanced domain expertise but you certainly in this now in the global knowledge economy you also need actors who might just have to you know have to have that just the necessary skills and the efficient skills to be able to function effectively i'm not saying that that's the reason why uh we we probably also have to pivot our thinking in terms of uh, tech war because certainly in germany in canada and australia that's not the way they look at technical and vocational program so so how do we how do we evangelize this i think uh, part of this is get those who have the domain expertise to be much more entrepreneurial and hence i think i say that you know anything that is much more market focused customer focused uh customer centered or in an in industry phasing is a good way to start and um and um and, 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 and hence, I think the research and development process and the product development process, the prototyping, the ideation part is informed by exactly what everyone is talking about here. But what they see on the ground, what they have observed and felt and experienced themselves as operating on the ground. So I think that is a much more I literally grounded way of looking at research and development and product development whether this product is fintech or agrotech or health etc mm -hmm. etc you know empathy on the ground empathy with people uh is, is is very basic in the in the whole innovation process and then the application of course of uh, the expertise comes next and hence i think we do need all of these ranges of human capital both in the very far advanced stage, as well as those who can come in as intermediaries of human capital. I, I, that's, all, that's all I can say. And, and also, you know, at the end of the day, they say, you know, Filipinos just want to get employed. Um, we're not, we not a nation of, uh, of uh, thinking of coming up with jobs for others or creating jobs for others. But it's a, it's, it's a long work in progress, but I think we're, we're starting, the, the mere fact that we're having this conversation, mm -hmm. I think is, uh, resonates well for Asik. what's uh, in the future. Asik, I want to go to what you said about expertise, the transfer of technology and knowledge and information. And I want to pose this question to you and perhaps attorney Michael Camino from Makati. You know, we want Makati to be the Silicon Valley of the Philippines. So we try to look at the other cities in the world that have done it. Singapore is, a, is considered a Silicon Valley of Asia. Bangalore in India is another. Shenzhen in China. When you think about it, the key to scaling up really and the key to what these countries, these cities outside of Manila did is they attracted international top-notch talent and technology from abroad to facilitate the transfer of expertise. I want to cite China. In China, Shenzhen, they gave humongous tax breaks so these startups, technocrats, big breaks for 10 years. And what did the locals do? For that 10 years, the locals just watched how these foreign experts did it. And then after 10 years, they learned and then they started their own. Do you think you know, this could be a template for how we can do transfer of technology and advanced knowledge? Could this be the right strategy? Because if we only look around us, you know, look for the mentors here also just in the Philippines, we could be, you know, tayo tayo na lang ulit. Could we be preaching to the choir in that effect, limiting the potential? I want to start with uh, uh, Attorney Michael from Makati. Do you think this is a good way? You offer big tax breaks, attract these foreign experts to teach the locals here, and then later maybe a few words from ASIC now. Attorney Michael? Well, it's, it's something that we can really discuss uh, with the council uh, because, of course, we know that this this will entail some uh, well temporary um, the temporary lack of um, income for the city of Makati, which we 
can use for other um, things mm -hmm. as well. But definitely, it's uh, something that we are open to uh, because aside from the business tax, and we, and we all do understand that when a company is uh, starting up, the, the income won't really be there yet. It, they'll be uh, spending uh, much more uh, and the return uh, will take a while. So we're, we're open to finding ways to help them um, catch up or will shorten their return period by lessening the giving them tax breaks and other incentives. Um, we're really in the process now of uh, amending our up or actually updating our in incentive code, our investments code. So um, it's something that we will be adding okay. uh, to it. All right. Asak Nap, very quickly, sir. Yeah. Yeah, very quickly, I think there are enabling policies now. The Philippine Innovation Act has come up with the specifics on, on basically providing all the necessary incentives along the lines that you were saying. Um, not, not to mention, I may not be able to talk about, but certainly the create law. But uh, the other thing, to the last one too, is that I think there is a, uh, the, there's a Filipino expert diaspora to tap on to begin with. And I think... Uh, we're beginning to also engage uh, our uh, Filipino experts from abroad and to kind of just uh, help us out here. You know, this continues to be a work in progress. As they say, it's easier to get a basketball coach, foreign basketball coach employed in the Philippines than to get a foreign chemistry professor employed, you know, for some odd reason. But I think that's a, that has got to change given all of these urgencies. And we've got this group right here this morning to make that happen. Uh, another question, this time uh, we have this question from Raymond Tribino of Malaya. Um, where can funding come from to achieve digitalization in farming? Maybe I can ask this from Yanni and then from Amor. Yanni, are investors ready for this kind of uh, investments, digitalization in farming? Yes, of course, but not just... Um the in the startup community not just it, for um angel investors but also the local government there was this one startup that partnered with um the government of navotas if i'm not mm -hmm. mistaken where their um startup was really mainly providing sustainable um vegetables to the community so it's actually very the farming industry is also very progressive right now. Of course, fintech still remains the number one um, startup technology or project out there. But uh, farming is is one way that we can um, we could look into, especially now during the pandemic, that there's this better sense of buying local, where we are more nationalistic in a sense. So we start buying fresh. Um, buying from our local farmers than from buying abroad. So this is something that we can definitely promote and look into. Yanni, I'm very curious. How much, is there a lot of money? That we're, how much money are we talking about? Is there a lot of money to go around to support these startups to begin with? There's a lot of money so, um, around because there are also a lot of um, investors from abroad who are coming into the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Actually, to get back to what um, Sir Juanillo was mentioning, saying earlier, there are already a lot of mentors who are here in the Philippines mentoring our existing startups. So, the like for our project, the Rise Challenge, we only require one Filipino in the startup. So, it's also for the Filipinos, but it's also for the startups. Um, abroad, we're encouraging encouraging them also to bring their business here. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why we also um, encouraged one co-founder who is a Filipino is because our culture is certainly different from those abroad. So that's one challenge that, you know, that they have to overcome that not necessarily if their startup or technology worked abroad, it would work here. They have to get a sense of um, the Filipinos' um, behavior, our spending mm -hmm. habits, et, et cetera. Okay, that's good to know. Amor, I wanted to get your take because um, you deal a lot okay. with the private sector and the public sector. On the private sector side, are Philippine investors ready? Uh, there's a notion that, you know, Philippine investors tend to be conservative. Um, some say even lack some imagination because here they say, you know, you need to show proof of concept. It's up and running. 
and then you show them, then they invest money. And like in the States, they're very aggressive. The investors will ready, are ready to put the money down, even just hearing your story or seeing a prototype. So what do you think? Are, 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 Filipino read, are Filipinos ready to invest when okay. you talk to the private sector? So um, two things. I wanted to touch very quickly on um, agriculture and investment, tech investments in agriculture. So uh, a few years back, I worked on what was first, the first ever agriculture hackathon with my mentor, Dr. Tito Ortiz. And uh, we went to Iloilo, we went to Davao, we went to um, Iloilo, Davao, and Batangas. Uh, and basically, our intent was how do we tech up agri? No? Mm. And I'll tell you, the winner, which was a... Um, tech solution to, to test the pH, the acidity of the water for shrimp farming. Okay, I, I cannot forget that. It got funded by the DOST. That's why I super love the DTI and the DOST, right? Um, such unobtrusive workers. So there are actually investments, no matter how humble, going into that space. What we need to be able to do is get them to surface it, right? So I know it sounds corny and cliche. We've done a lot of pitch fest and hackathons. Don't ever forget to go, you know, don't get ever tired to listen to the new ideas because there's always a diamond in the rough. And also at the same time for um, startups to constantly pitch, never get tired of pitching, never lose that startup chip on your shoulder. I remember... Um, just a few weeks back, first week of February, uh, we also sponsored a uh, little French tech startup, so Filipinos and French startups. And um, uh, we saw there a lot of uh, uh, innovative solutions that also had agriculture at front and center of it. Um, let me give you just an idea to think about. You look at the commodity like Pili. If I were a plant, I'd be a peely plant, okay? The peely nut, rather. The most resilient. You can only grow the best peely in the Bicol region because of all the calamities that confront it. I mean, you can plant it in your, your, your uh, porch here in Salcedo the village, but it will not be the kind of peely you get in Bicol. What if we are able to tokenize, for example, peely? Use blockchain technology to create a way to track the source so that a Bicol, a, a, a Pili planted in Bicol will command a premium compared to the Pili being grown elsewhere, for example, in, in China or in the U.S. No? So there are so many opportunities for agriculture and food to get teched up, um, which dovetails into what you said about the readiness of uh, uh, Filipinos to invest. On the contrary, what I've seen is that some of the biggest conglomerates in the country are actually funneling their investments into nascent tech. For example, um, the Gok Kongwe Group, one of the more progressive, although they are very rooted in traditional legacy businesses like media or even retail, they're one of the most aggressive funders of startups in the country, right? So going into e-commerce with Locad, with e -daily, enabling other businesses in the process. So um, yes, there's actually a lot of money going around. And what we hope to be able to do with the Department of Trade and Industry is actually to put the Philippines out there to be the recipients of these investments. We're second only to Singapore and Indonesia right now. And there is no reason for us because of the sheer size of our market and the readiness of our population to get a lion's share of all that investment is interest going into Asia. Remember, sorry, my slip is showing for fintech. ASEAN, Asia is actually the largest fintech in the world. And we are at front and center of it. We are in the spotlight indeed. A final question now, and I want to direct this to both women in the panel for Amor and Yanni. Why do we seem and why do we need to be aggressive when it comes to transforming the Philippine startup ecosystem? Yanni, and then we go to Amor. Well, let me just 
give you um, the setting right now in the Philippines. The smartphone users last 2018 were accounted to about 65%. This 2021, we are now at 98.5%. And in the Philippines, we spend um, about four hours and 15 minutes on average in social media. And we even beat globally the, the average of two hours and 45 minutes. So this will tell you how everything is in the Philippines. Pre-pandemic, um, just what um, Sir Juanillo said, people wanted paychecks every month. So people wanted to have to be employed. But now, uh, because of the pandemic, you turn on your, new, your YouTube or TikTok or even your Facebook, and everybody has sort of become entrepreneurs by selling something online or even creating uh, content, right? So you see a lot of people saying, hi guys, I am here or giving content or saying anything. A lot of people right now have turned into uh, digital innovators. And this is the reason why we really have to start now. This is the reason why we have to be very aggressive. You know, um, the Gcash users, uh, account to about 70% of the adult population. This is 51 million people. So we, we, we have the capacity to do everything online right now. In fact, digital transactions have increased 74%, right? So a lot of Filipinos, about 4 million Filipinos, opened um, accounts digitally. Everything's happening now because of everything's happening through digital means right now because of the pandemic. So it makes sense um, pertaining also to Amor's um, statement earlier to digitalize everything. And so this is why we tell people, if you have a business, go tech, because it's also very scalable, whether it's e-commerce, and I'm part of that, well, the people who are purchasing almost every day online, uh, whether it's food and beverage technology, I'm also part of that. I order at least once a day. Um, this is about about 8.83 million people order online. And this is just for takeout, okay? And there's also health technology. So before, if you wait like um, an hour or three hours for your doctor, for it to be your turn, and I'm sorry to say my husband's a doctor, but they're mostly almost late. Now you can do it online. So this thing, this has changed the scene right now. The, the setup of how the setting was before, it's no longer the same right now. So this is the catalyst that will promote people to, to sort of change the, the ways that we have been used to. So if you're not going to do it now, take advantage of all of the situations where people's behaviors have changed, especially their financial spending. When are you going to do it? Right, sayang business. Right, sayang business. Do it now, Amor. Yes, the Philippine technology train has taken off and the momentum is dizzying. I, I can't even keep up with it. The point is, technology will not slow down for any of us. So it's up to us. So when you said, why do we need to be aggressive? Two reasons. Technology will not wait for anyone. And the Philippine train has actually left the station, right? So we all need to keep track with it. More importantly, this is a function of national pride. A few months back, I had the chance to um, speak with uh, a Western country. Let me just leave it at that. Uh, they wanted to take part in Digital Filipinas, and I was very grateful for that opportunity. But being the usual um, Western country that they are, they're like, this is what we do, blah, 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 blah. How can we help the Philippines? Um, they were, of course, well-meaning. At that point, I said, as a little brown female Asian, sir, with all due respect, you have 10 banking licenses, digital banking licenses. Europe has 15, Asia has 40, and us, your former colony, has six. Sir, what can we do for you to help advance your fintech businesses in the Philippines? And it felt so good to be able to say that, right? This is the year of not just ASEA, ASEAN, but also the year of the Philippines. We have the natural propensity for it. Our uptake for technology at whatever point 
when texting was nascent and when social media was nascent, we were at front and center. And now we're seeing it for crypto update and we are leading in the play to earn space. So the, the proof points are indisputable. So are we going to allow um, our country to not lead in this revolution when clearly by all indications, we have what it takes to lead and not follow. And that question we leave to all our viewers this morning. We know the correct answer, but we have to act on those answers. Thank you very much, Amor. Uh, Yanni, Attorney Michael, and Asik Knapp. Uh, the learnings and insights really giving us a so much more greater appreciation for our cities and of course technology's role in developing our cities and our country's potential. At this point, we wanna hear from the Makati mayor, uh, Ms. Abby Binay, although she grew up in a political family, Makati Mayor Abby Binay has undoubtedly etched her own mark as a public servant and visionary leader. During her first term in office from 2016 to 2019, she prioritized the integration of modern technology into the systems and operations of the city government to promote transparency and enhance the city's overall competitiveness, driven by her vision of Makati as a smart city. That is, progressive, inclusive, and sustainable. Under her leadership, Makati has been globally recognized as one of the most innovative cities in the world. Here is her address. Let's listen to this. My fellow champions of innovation and sustainability, good morning. The call for entrepreneurship has never been louder. With the advent of new technologies and the ever-growing global marketplace, businesses are looking for creative thinkers who can help them stay ahead of the curve. The global startup economy is dynamic and active. Many resources are available to help entrepreneurs get started, including incubators, accelerators, and funding organizations. However, we lack a government-led initiative that provides entrepreneurs with essential business resources, industry experts, and the business skills necessary to move forward in the industry. In Makati, we believe that entrepreneurship and digital technology are needed to compete and win in the 21st century. I was inspired to launch the RISE Challenge by the Barcelona Activa. It is a government initiative started in the 80s that supported entrepreneurs, which is a one-stop shop for startups. I was allowed to tour the internationally recognized Barcelona Tech Hub in 2019 while I was there to participate in the Smart City World Expo Congress. Incidentally, Makati landed on the top six in the innovative idea category and we were the sole Philippine finalist. My first hang encounter with the Tech Hub made me realize our country still has a long way to go in terms of nurturing entrepreneurs and embracing innovation and technology. Clearly, the startup route is the best path for cutting edge technology and disruptive ideas. The traditional models still work, yes, but we have to be open to the possibilities and explore opportunities around us. I hope for the Philippines to rank higher in the international startup scene. RISE, or Resiliency in Innovation, Sustainability, and Entrepreneurship, is Makati's answer to the call of the times. We are committed to nurturing and growing the startup ecosystem in the Philippines by providing access to resources, mentorship, and funding. There are currently many incubators and accelerators in the city. They have done good work in supporting startups and encouraging more entrepreneurs to refine their business models to develop a product or service that is tech-enabled and scalable. We believe that we can enable the startup ecosystem to thrive and help businesses stay ahead of the curve. Makati is the first city to pioneer an incubator program with a comprehensive scope. The intensive 12-week program is fully immersive, offering cash grants, entrepreneurship training, and a chance to pitch to qualified investors. We partnered with the University of Makati and the Ronin Group to create RISE, or the Tomas V. Lopez Jr. Resiliency, Innovation, Sustainability, and Entrepreneurship Certified Program. It is a collaboration between the three pillars of a startup ecosystem, the local government, the academe, and the investing community. We believe that there is no lack of talent, creativity, or brilliant ideas. The question is how to nurture that talent through mentorship, planning, and then finding the capital to launch the business. 
This is why Makati is giving startup companies who make it through the qualifying round a 500,000 equity free grant to complete the 12-week program without worrying about their finances. During the 12 weeks, entrepreneurs can focus on the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to learn about finance, legal, marketing, organization building, and effective pitching directly from the most qualified educators and experienced industry practitioners. Once they're ready, these startup companies will be allowed to present to qualified investors sometime in July 2023. Another good thing about Project RISE is that it provides students of the University of Makati the opportunity to learn about entrepreneurship as an alternative career path after graduating. I believe it is high time to break the stereotype and show students that their options need not be limited to finding a job after graduation and working for someone else until they grow old and gray. Incidentally, we are celebrating the 50th founding anniversary of the University of Makati this year. Not a few may know that the university embodies my father's dreams and hopes for the young people of Makati. Together with his friend, esteemed educator Tomas B. Lopez Jr., after whom the certification program is named, he has proven that when we embrace innovation in education and create an enabling environment, for students to excel and prosper, we truly fulfill the promise of education in the development of nations. For six years now, my administration has focused on PPPs or public-private partnerships that would create an enabling environment for businesses and more so for startups. We have integrated modern technology into the systems and operations of the city to promote transparency, make public services more efficient, and enhance its overall competitiveness. Once again, I would like to in invite all creative Filipinos to bring your businesses to Makati. Here we provide a competitive environment, fantastic co-working spaces, tax breaks, business registration assistance, and a reliable mentoring program. Remember, there is an equity-free grant of 500000 which you can spend while you are in the program. Finally, we will give you an opportunity to fund your businesses by presenting you to qualified investors at the end of your 12-week training. I'm excited to see what the future holds for Filipino startup companies, and we look forward to working with entrepreneurs who share our vision of a more sustainable and innovative future. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much uh, to the mayor of Makati, Mayor Abi Binay, for that uh, uh, remarks. At this point, we'd like to call on Ms. Yanni de Guzman uh, from the Ronin Group and the Rice Challenge for the closing remarks. Yanni? So let me begin first by thanking Ms. Amor and her team for all their hard work in initiating the Digital Filipinas Innovative Cities Program. I am all for taking up the Philippines one city at a time. Under Secretary Fita Aldaba, ASEC Juanillo, my thanks for being with us this morning, together with the DTI, DOSP, DICT, and other government agencies. Thank you for continuously supporting the startup community, especially through the Innovation Startup Act and numerous um, startup acceleration and incubation programs. Lastly, I would like to thank the city of Makati, headed by Mayor Abby, represented today by Attorney Kamina, for heading programs such as the RISE Challenge and for providing a 500,000 equity-free grant to create more business opportunities. To all the creative viewers with us today, this pandemic has prompted a more conscious intent and desire among Filipino consumers to support local entrepreneurs, whether they are goods or services. The BCG Center for Consumer Insight discovered that 53% of their respondents felt that the Filipino community is more supportive during this ongoing crisis. In fact, globally, trust in the government and other national institutions has also increased by 30%. This shows all of us that we should take advantage of these developments. So do you have a business idea? Tell us. Do you want to grow your current business? Ask us. Do you want to start now? Then join us in the RISE Challenge. Strike while the iron is hot, and we will be there to assist you in your journey. For more information, please visit www.rice-program.com. I repeat, please visit www.rice-program.com. Thank you for being with us today.
All right, thank you so much, Yanni, for the closing remarks. I believe everyone here is so excited to see much more tech innovations and startups that will cause Makati to attract even more investors. It might even become the Silicon Valley of the Philippines, and not just that, of Asia. And there's so much to look forward to. At the end of the day, Makati is just one city, 145 other cities to go, Amor. It's a tall order, teching up the Philippines one city at a time but you've got Digital Filipinas and government agencies supporting, joining forces with the DTI and Board of Investment, the city of Makati and the RISE. The future indeed is tech and it's looking bright. Thank you so much everyone, to our panelists, to our speakers. Thank you for joining us this morning and to you who watched us and joined us. And we look forward to seeing, with you, uh, seeing you again soon. Have a great day ahead. The RISE Challenge was inspired by the Barcelona Activa. It is a government initiative started in the 80s that gave support to entrepreneurs, a one-stop shop for startups. We chanced upon this when Makati officials went to Barcelona as part of their training for a program for smart cities run by the Development Academy of the Philippines. The officials were able to tour the internationally recognized Tech Hub, which was fully supported by the Barcelona city government as it was aimed to boost the local economy, provide innovation, and promote talent development. Through the RISE Challenge and Makati City's full support in this, Mayor Abi Binay hopes that the Philippines will rank higher in the startup international scene. Every billion dollar company today had to start somewhere. They were once a startup. Apple was once a startup. Google once a startup. Amazon once a startup. So you could say that it's very significant because the next big company, maybe not this year, maybe not even next year, but the future is in startups. So they really cannot be neglected. You have to develop them well. Our program focuses on the five aspects of finance, legal, marketing, team development, and effective pitching. We've gathered mentors who have a passion for sharing their knowledge and experiences. The Philippine Startup Survey in 2020 also identified that 47% of startups are family funded. Outside of this group, most partnerships have not come into fruition due to mismatched visions with investors, chaotic business structures, and an unclear market target. After the program, the founders will have the opportunity to pitch their ideas to investors who share their vision. Our group knows what investors are looking for and we know how to prepare the startup for funding. Maine is really a great place to find startups as we are seen as a premier and largest and most active angel investment association in the country. Maine members are expected to invest 1 million a year, which translate to 100 million annual deployable investment funds for startups. The support of the Makati LGU can be a very welcome strategic initiative Kudos to Ronin for partnering with them for this project. There are things government can provide which the private sector just can't. One area in which we can make a difference is supporting smart cities initiatives. It is so heartening to see Makati LGU and Ronin now playing an active role in supporting Philippine startups. On behalf of Mayor Abi Binay, the city of Makati would like to invite all creative Filipinos to bring your businesses here. We provide a competitive environment, fantastic co-working spaces, tax breaks, business registration assistance, and a reliable mentoring program. Makati will even take it further by giving you an equity-free grant of 500,000 pesos. Finally, we will give you an opportunity to fund your businesses by presenting you to qualified investors at the end of the program. Join us in the RISE Challenge. Amidst the vastness and diversity of the world. Somewhere in the Asia Pacific, you will find the Pearl of the Orient. Right here, the Philippines. Beyond its beaches and rich culture, 
Here is Southeast Asia's second largest and youngest population with a literacy rate among the highest in the world. Here, the mobile penetration is incomparable. Here, internet users spend the most time online, the longest across the globe. Here is the social media capital of the world. Here, people are digitally adept and early adopters of new innovations. Here, businesses have accelerated their digital transformation and emerged into e-industries. This is all supported by world-class digital infrastructure, the Philippines' widest fiber optic network, an expansive submarine cable network and points of presence. and the largest data center network in the country. Here, across its more than 7,000 islands, making it the ideal digital market destination. Discover it here, only here, the Philippines.